North Americans tend to generalize when considering the native tribes that once populated the continent. An idea that they all lived in small villages in tents of animal skins or small wooden lean-tos predominates. It is an image presented by Hollywood, television, and the western novels of Louis L'Amour and Zane Grey. The image is inaccurate in most cases. The Native American tribes were of several nations, diverse cultures, and their impact on modern life remains immeasurable. They changed the way the world ate and still eats. They were the first society to cultivate corn potatoes, and the southwestern Native Americans and those of Mexico gave the world chocolate. Though some lived in primitive conditions, others developed large and complex societies with class systems and forms of government which rivaled those of contemporaneous Europe. Here in the video today, 10 misconceptions about the native tribes of North America and some insights into tribal life when the Europeans first came to the New World. Number 10. They were primitive tribes of hunter-gatherers. The ancient city of Cahokia alone belies the idea that North American natives were primitive tribes living in tents of animal skins or simple wood huts. Archaeological studies prove Cahokia was a thriving city, covering more than six square miles of Illinois land across the Mississippi River from present-day St. Louis. More than 100,000 people lived there for four centuries before the coming of Christopher Columbus. Houses were placed in a manner similar to modern American cities, with open public spaces and parks in a grid marked by wide streets. Evidence of water distribution systems exists in the ruins of the ancient city, which was abandoned around the beginning of the 13th century for reasons yet unknown. The Algonquian tribes of North America built large towns with multi-story dwellings in many cases, surrounded by fields of crops and orchards. Game and fish provided a significant portion of their diet, and roving bands from within their own tribe and others often competed for food and raided the villages of other peoples. The majority of North American natives spent their lives near their place of birth, and less war or natural disasters forced them to move to more promising areas. There were tribes of nomadic people, such as the Apache in the southwestern states and the Plains Indians, but the majority of native tribes occupied lands for centuries and defended them against their enemies. Number 9. They had no concept of land ownership The often cited idea that American Indians had no concept of land ownership and property rights is completely devoid of fact. They did. Native Americans claimed ownership of vast tracts of lands on which they lived hunted and farmed. They claimed territorial rights based on conquest, purchase, exchange, and inheritance. They bought and sold lands to each other and to arriving European settlers. Often, in dealing with the latter, they sold property rights to lands which were claimed by other tribes, essentially swindling the Europeans. The mythical sale of Manhattan Island to the Dutch for $24 worth of trinkets was one such instance. The natives that sold the land to Peter Minuet for 60 Dutch guilders, about $1,000, conveyed land which was not theirs to begin with. Later, the Cherokee sold the rights to live in the Transylvania region of then Virginia, now Kentucky, in the Sycamore Shoals Treaty. The Cherokee sold lands which were not strictly theirs, it being shared by mutual agreement as hunting grounds with the Shawnee and Wyandotte. The Cherokee nation splintered following the treaty, with numerous bands of warriors attacking the ensuing white settlements in the Bluegrass region. Similar events with the Shawnee and allied tribes, such as the Mingo and Miami, occurred in the regions which became Ohio, Indiana, in Illinois. American history is replete with incidents in which Native American tribes sold or traded lands in agreements which tribal elements refused to accept and started wars with the settlers who occupied the lands. Number 8. The European and later American settlers broke every treaty made with them. The idea of white settlers scamming the Native Americans, treating with them under false pretenses, and violating every treaty made with them out of greed gained precedence in the 1950s and 1960s. The acceptance of this concept coincided with the civil rights movement in the United States. Both sides broke treaties, just as both sides committed atrocities on the other. For example, in 1757, the British garrison at Fort William Henry in New York surrendered to a French and Indian force under Louis-Joseph de Montcalm. Montcalm promised the British and American troops and several of their families safe passage. His Indian allies ignored the agreement and massacred men, women, and children. Pontiac's Rebellion, Tecumseh's Confederation, and the Northwest Indian War and the Black Hawk War all began with native violations of treaties negotiated and agreed to by tribal elders. Conversely, the Great Sioux War and other conflicts with the Western tribes began following encroachments of American settlers on Indian lands in violation of treaties. The history of negotiations and treaties with the American Indian tribes contains incidents of false dealings, misrepresentations, and out-and-out -out falsehoods by Indians and whites going back to the earliest days of colonization of the Americas by the Europeans. Number 
1947, they lived in humble dwellings of earth, wood, and animal skins. Well, some tribes did live in such abodes. The teepees, wooden huts, and igloos of Hollywood and history were real. Not all Native Americans lived in crude structures, however, and some resided in dwellings of considerable sophistication. When General John Sullivan commanded the punitive expedition against the Onondaga Seneca and Cayuga in 1779, his troops were surprised at the native villages they encountered. They observed well-built homes of stone and wood, many with multiple stories and windows paned with glass. Elsewhere, American Indians built elaborate homes with an eye towards their architecture. Tribes of the American Southwest built roomed homes of mud and adobe. The Navajo constructed permanent homes known as hogans with wooden frameworks forming a dome covered with mud and stone. In the southern plains, houses covered with grass protected the inhabitants from the elements. Long before the arrival of the Europeans to the Pacific Northwest, Native Americans used cedar planks lashed to wooden frames to erect houses and to serve as drying sheds for the fish they harvested from the region's streams and the water of the Pacific. Number six, they were a largely egalitarian society. Class status among the vast majority of American Indian tribes followed family lines, with some tribes based on matrilineal societies and others patrilineal. For nearly all, status was conferred based on the degree of relationship with tribal leaders. Among the Cherokee, for example, women owned the property belonging to the family. Women brought their husbands into the family, often into the family home. The descent of tribal chiefs in matrilineal clans and thus control over tribal affairs was through the mother. Men marrying into the family and matrilineal tribes had no standing within the clan, not even as fathers raising their children. The mother's brothers or sons assumed the role of raising their nieces or sisters' children. Among the Northern Plains tribes, particularly the Lakota and Dakota, the long-standing myth of women serving as humble squaws subservient to their husbands is false. Lakota women and girls were trained in the arts of hunting and war and frequently fought enemies in defense of the home, though they seldom joined raiding parties. Their standing within the community depended on their abilities to serve the tribe as it did with the men. In matrilineal tribes, the male leader, known as the chief, remained in practice subservient to his mother by tradition and unwritten law. Number 5. The Southwestern Tribes Roamed the Deserts and Mountains Some did, particularly after the horse was introduced to the continent when the Spaniards arrived. The Apache and Comanche, in particular, adapted to the horse for both hunting and raiding enemies. Centuries before that event, the ancestral Pueblo peoples resided in the area, now known as the Four Corners, where Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona meet. Eight centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ, they cultivated corn in the form of maize to supplement their diet of game. They built irrigation systems to support their crops, which included waters routed from the Rio Grande, Colorado, and Little Colorado rivers. Their irrigation systems allowed the planting of beans and squash to supplement their crops of corn. The Apache and Navajo roamed the region, hunting the area to exhaustion over the centuries, leaving to pursue the game. The ancestral Pueblos endured several extended droughts followed by flooding which destroyed much of their farmlands and irrigation systems. By the time the Spanish arrived, most of them were gone from the region, having fled the area and the Apache and Navajo raiders. The Spaniards encountered their relatively few descendants still living in multi-story dwelling complexes which the Europeans called pueblos or villages. Most were located along the rivers which had once fed the complex system of canals and dams watering their crops. Number 4. The New World was sparsely settled at the time of Columbus When the first Europeans arrived at what they soon called the New World, they encountered spaces like nothing they'd ever seen before. Vast virgin forests stretched to the water's edge in some areas, others found open plains and what they believed and reported as small populations of natives. In Mesoamerica, the Spaniards and Portuguese encountered the cities of the Mayan, Incan, and Aztec civilizations. In North America, the early European arrivals reported the Indians living in relatively small villages and towns. With no idea of the size and diversity of the North American continent, rulers and scholars in Europe believed the New World was sparsely populated by uncivilized peoples as wild as the game which teemed in the woods. In truth, between 60 and 70 million natives lived on the North American continent from the Arctic Circle to its southernmost extremity. Numerous cultures emerged on the continent before the European arrival, including the mound builders, the Confederate 
Confederation of the Iroquois, the Hopi, and Pueblo, and the Inuit in the north. The various Indian nations and clans were connected by a complex system of trails through the eastern woods and on the plains cut by migrating buffalo. Elaborate diplomatic relationships developed with alliances and agreements over the use of hunting grounds, water rights, and tribal property. Trade between tribes such as furs and game for crops and weapons was in place. The Europeans understood none of it, nor the extent of the population in North America, which exceeded that of the continent from whence they came. Number three, the North American natives did not engage in warfare with each other. Beginning in the 1960s and continuing through the present day, a myth over intertribal warfare among the American tribes gained acceptance. The myth essentially blames the Europeans for introducing warfare to North America. Its proponents claimed that native tribes did not make war on one another, other than in demonstrations of courage by touching an enemy with a coup stick. The claim is nonsense. Archaeological evidence and the various tribes' own folklore describe centuries of warfare between tribes across the entire continent. Cannibalism among the North American tribes was ritualized. Eating the flesh of enemy warriors killed in battle or tortured as prisoners was recorded contemporaneously by witnesses. The Western Plains saw numerous wars between the various tribes competing for the resources offered by the land. The nomadic tribes followed the buffalo, their chief source of meat, furs, and tools manufactured from the bones. In the eastern woodlands, European explorers found many of the tribes living in villages and towns protected by palisades and extensive alarm systems in place to warn of an impending encroachment. The completely peaceful, idyllic existence described by some required neither. Warfare between tribes did not end with a united attempt to wipe out the arriving Europeans. Instead, many tribes allied themselves with the new arrivals, happy to have their superior weapons available for use against ancient enemies. Number two, their religions were based on a great spirit. Hollywood created the myth of Indians worshipping a great spirit, though they had other gods and spiritual entities as well. The North American Indians had as many religious systems as tribes and differing ways of worshipping. Some, such as the Pueblo, worshipped the crops as they grew in the fields. Some tribes believed that spirits controlled the weather and developed rituals to appease them. Nearly all worshipped the sun in some form or another, as well as the moon and other celestial bodies. Omens revealed through chances achieved by various means bore great spiritual significance and affected the direction of personal and tribal affairs. The Iroquois did believe in a great spirit, the creator of all things, including the spirit which flowed through all things. The Mohawk, like many tribes, believed that all existence was imbued with spirit. Nearly all the North American Indians held similar beliefs, creating religions based on animism, the idea that all things possess life in some form and hence are animated. The belief extended to rocks, water, the weather, animals, birds, trees, and even sounds. The spirits in control could be either evil or good, with existence a continuous struggle between the extremes. Many Eastern tribes believed the smoke from tobacco carried messages to the spirits and Smoking was a major part of religious ceremonies. Number one, they grew only simple crops to supplement their diets of meat and fish. Native American tribes are connected to maize, a type of corn which they grew so extensively that it came to be known as Indian corn. They also grew beans of several types, gourds to serve as utensils, pumpkins for food, and other forms of squash. Along the eastern seaboard, Indians husbanded tobacco crops from Florida to the Connecticut Valley. Through time, myths emerged about the Indians, which led to the belief that they sustained themselves with game and fish, supplemented by just a few berries and nuts harvested from the forests. Not so. Many Indian villagers had extensive farms with the crops grown communally. As with all farmers, crops grown depended on the local climate and soil conditions. The Spanish in the south were astonished to see Indians eating freely of tomatoes, at the time believed in Europe to be poisonous. In the southwest, progressive farming techniques such as terracing and crop rotation were applied by Indian farmers. Indian crops included potatoes and sweet potatoes, several types of peppers, peanuts, avocados, sunflowers, and wild rice. Most Indian villagers had communal storehouses to store crops for the winter months. Orchards cultivated by Indians provided cherries, apples, and crab apples. They also resorted freely to native plants for greens, including dandelion and chicory. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this. Also, why not check out another channel I do? It's more laid back and a bit more fun than this one. It's called Business Blaze. I'm going to link to it below. And thank you for watching.